Father, thank you again for the opportunity to preach your word. I ask, O oh Lord, that you help me to preach, help us to listen, and help us to do according to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Look there at verse 29 and 30, Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30. The Bible says, For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. The title of my sermon this morning is Predestination and Preteration. Predestination and Preteration. Preteration, you probably might not have heard that before, but what are the definitions of this? Predestination literally means for for ordination or predetermination. So that those are other words for predestination. And preteration means passing over or omission or disregard. So it technically, uh, it, it kind of works hand in hand. Something that is predestinated and something that is preterated or preteration means passing over. So you predestinate something, you foreordain something. Preteration means you disregard orders and you predestinate these ones. All right. What does the Bible mean, though, by predestination as it pertains to salvation? From the beginning, God knew all those that would believe the gospel. And that is called the foreknowledge of God, right? So God's foreknowledge enables him, or with God's foreknowledge, he then predestinates with his foreknowledge. So the Bible says, for whom he did foreknow, right, in verse 29, uh, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. So the ones that he foreknew, he didn't just predestinate people. He foreknew them that they would get saved. That's pertaining to salvation. He foreknew them and then he did predestinate, right? He did foreordain. He did predetermine, right? So God knows the end from the beginning and that's who God is. Open to Isaiah chapter 42. I mean, throughout the Bible, you're going to see this, that God knows the end from the beginning. But I'm just going to focus on Isaiah, a few passages from Isaiah to show you that God knows knows the end from the beginning, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the Bible says. Isaiah 42, look at verse 8, Isaiah 42, verse 8, the Bible says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. See, that is who God is. So God knows what is going to happen in the future. So he has foreknowledge. Open to Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44. So the former things have come to pass, right? Because oh, those are the things that he said in his word and, you know, the, uh, nothing is new under the sun. And new things, because the Bible is still being written at this time. And new things uh, uh, do God declare, do I declare, the Bible says, before they spring forth. So God knows at the end from the beginning. Look at Isaiah 44. Look at verse 6. Thus said the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who as I, so who as I, so who can be compared to me that does so, so, and so, look at this, and who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. So who can do that as I? I can do it. The things that are coming, the things that shall come, because God foreknows the things that are coming. He know at the end from the beginning. The Bible also says in Isaiah 46, you can open to Isaiah 46. Last one there. Isaiah 46 verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are, are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. You see, God is showing us that there is none like him. Open to Acts chapter 2, by the way. There is none like him. Every time you see he uh, precedes 
uh, his foreknowledge of him declaring his foreknowledge by saying there is no God like me there is none like me I am the God there is none beside me see he says he's declaring the end from the beginning he is the end he is the end he is the beginning he's Alpha and Omega and the ancient times uh, and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done so from the old times from the times of the Bible the old ways right he's declaring things that are not yet done declaring the latter things are going to happen in the latter days and his counsel shall stand so God is not affected by time he created time so he's, he exists outside time and space he's not affected by all that and God has foreknowledge of everything that will happen but people accuse God because of his attributes because of the attribute that he has the foreknowledge they accuse him of predetermining who is going to get saved and who is not going to get saved no he knew or he knows those that will be saved he knew them from the beginning of the world from the foundation of the world he knew what happened at the end so those people that decided that would get saved that decided to believe on the gospel what did he do to them he also did predestinate that means those that he foreknew he predestinated them to be conformed to the image of his son so if you're going to get saved since you're going to believe those guys are going to believe i'm going to make you look like my son right i'm going to give you the glory of my son you're going to be joint heirs with my my son that's what he's saying he's not saying oh i'm just going to pick some people that will get saved from the beginning of the world i don't care if you believe or you don't believe i'm just going to pick you these are the ones i'll get saved no matter what they think or what they believe these are no that's not how god does he knows those are get saved so people skip for whom he did for no they just say oh god predestinates everyone that gets saved no those that he knew that will be saved all right let's let me stick back to my notes here so God has foreknowledge of everything that will happen and many areas in the Bible God tells the future through prophecies right especially the passion of the Christ right the suffering of Christ the death of the Christ of Christ the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 Acts chapter 2 verse 22 ye men of Israel Acts 2 22 ye men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain by the foreknowledge of God God knew what would happen God did not look at all the disciples and say ah, Judas is you're the one that's going to betray me. No, he knows that Judas will betray him. He had the foreknowledge that Judas will betray him, right? So it was predicted, right? He knew that they would take him and they'll seize him and they'll kill him. He didn't make them do it, right? They chose to do it, but his foreknowledge. So God determined, I know they're going to do it and I'm still going. So he determined by his foreknowledge that, his, that, uh, that Jesus will be taken and by wicked hands crucified and slain. You see that? So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the next part says, also, he also did, all right, let's read it again. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. Also, Jesus was going to rise from the dead. God knew that. And become the firstborn, first fruits, right? First fruits from the dead. So God wanted all believers to be like Jesus. So those that are going to be saved will be like Jesus. We will have that glorified body like Jesus. He will be conformed to the image of Jesus, the spiritual body, which we'll get to. So it was predetermined that believers will be in Christ's image. It wasn't predetermined those that will be saved, right? Right? It was predetermined that those that choose to believe will be in Christ's image. That's what that verse is saying. All right, move on to the next phrase. Whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Those that believe, God chose to be saved. Because the called means to be saved. I'm going to show that to you. Open to John chapter 6. John chapter 6 verse 44. The called is to be saved. Those that answer the call of the gospel are those that are saved. Right? Yes, we call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. But we are first called by God. No one gets saved by himself. So just like wisdom is out there calling to the simple, as you see in the beginning of Proverbs, that is like salvation call. We go out there to call people unto the Lord. The Lord is drawing people unto himself. The Bible says in John 6, 44, No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. So no man can come to God except God draw 
wasn't. And that's why when God gives up on some people, that's the reprobate doctrine, then it's too late for them. They cannot be saved. They've been rejected of the Lord. But no man can come to God except the Father which sent, except God draws him, basically. In John chapter 1, let's flip back to John chapter 1. Look at verse 12 and 13. John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that, that believe under his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So it's God that draws them, and it's God that, you know, makes, spiritually changes them, baptizes them in the Lord, and, you know, revive, get, makes them born again, basically. So it's not of their will, it's not, they can't do it by themselves, it is God that draws them, and they are born of God. God. So to be called means to be saved. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Many examples of when the Bible is talking about the called, it's just talking about believers. Those that are saved. Those that are joined to the body of Christ or uh, to the church. It's talking about to the saints. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 9. We start off with verse 9. God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, him, whom you were called to the fellowship of his Son, that's talking about you being saved, you being, being part of the body of Christ. So, that is what it means to be called. Look at verse 18, 1 Corinthians, 9, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Now, compare that with verse 23 and 24. But we preach Christ crucified, right? The preaching of the cross. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, right? Both the Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Remember, the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but unto us which are saved, but unto them which are called. See how they are used interchangeably. So you're saved, you're called. It's the same thing. You're called are those that are saved. Because they answer the call of the gospel. The gospel is out there trying to reach everyone. They answer the call of the gospel. Open to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Go to chapter 7 real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'll read from verse 17. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 17. But as God had distributed to every man, as the Lord had called everyone. And when he says God has called everyone, he's talking to the church here, right? So, as God has called everyone, as God has distributed to every man, as God has called everyone, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called it's just like saying were you saved as a Jew were you saved as a Greek you see is anyone being called in circumcision is anyone called uncircumcised that's what he's saying are you saved as a Jew as a Greek uh, like, or Gentile so if you are saved as a Jew hey I mean you can't uncircumcise yourself just remain circumcised but if you're saved as a Gentile hey remain uncircumcised you don't have to circumcise yourself because circum if you circumcise if you uh, circumcise yourself, then Christ profited you nothing. That's if that's where you're depending on to go to heaven to keep all the laws of God, then Christ profited you nothing because it's by faith. That's what he's saying. So just stay in the same calling wherein you are called. As you were saved, just stay in that, you know, circumcision or circumcision, stay in that way. A thou called being a servant, I'm reading verse 21 now. A thou called being a servant, care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. So if you're called as a servant, right? Because in the, in, during this time, Rome ruled, right? And many people were servants of Rome or just servants to masters, basically. It's not just in the time of Rome, even now. No matter where you're called, how you are, what social status you are, all of that, hey, there's nothing wrong because you're called and you're now saving me. So yeah, you fight for your freedom and you must have all the freedom and kill all your masters. No, <laughs> you know, continue in your calling that where you're called. Now, if you can be made free, right? If you can pay off your 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 servanthood or why you're being on the uh, service, if you can pay that off, yeah, use it rather because when you're free, then you can do more work for God without having to answer your master and answer your master. You can you're free to do more for God. So use it rather. So. 
But God is saying, make your life better physically, though, if you can. Now, spiritually, you say, oh no, I have to be circumcised spiritually. So, uh, sorry, circumcised physically because I was, I was called. God said, no. Circumcision doesn't profit anything. God is looking for the circumcision of the heart, right? So, but physically, if you can make your life better, you were called as a servant. That means you were saved and you were a servant. Hey, if you can be made free, be made free. And God will use you more, right? God doesn't want us to be in bondage to sin or the things and the rudiments of this world, right? Verse 22, for he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. So, no matter how you see yourself, if you're a free man, you're not a citizen of Rome, or you're not, like I'm just in, uh, pertaining to them, or you're not, you're not a free man, when you're called, you're a servant of, uh, you, uh, you're God's free man. You have liberty in the spirit. Now, you look at yourself, well, I'm free. I'm a citizen have everything that I want. I have uh, all the rights and I can do anything I want. Remember you're God's servant. Now it goes both ways for both people. But God's just trying to make it clear that you're still a servant of Christ. And he says, ye are bought with a, bought with a price. Be not ye servants of men. So what does that verse mean? I mean, I thought he just said, if you're called being a servant, be a servant. He said, be not ye servants of men. You are bought with a price. Now he's talking spiritually. Everything you're doing should be unto the Lord. Right? That's why he said, be not servants of men. Remember, you're serving the Lord. Yes, you're serving your master, but do it unto the Lord. Right? What you're doing unto men, do it unto the Lord. Let God be your master. How? When you go to work your secular jobs right you're serving god no matter how harsh your master is or anything what he says to do except to sin you're serving the lord do it unto the lord right so that's what god is saying uh, being all ye servants of men, brethren, let every man wherein he is called, therein abide with God. Now, why I went through explaining this passage is just to show you what the call means. Because it kept using called, called, called. You can just interchange that with where you're saved. You see that? So called means being saved. Open to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So far, talking about predestination and preteration. Predestination and preteration. Predestination is foreknowledge, right? Uh, uh, sorry. For ordained, predetermined. But people skip the fact that God has foreknowledge, right? So God knew those that would believe the gospel from the foundation of the world. Uh, it says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So he predestinated those that he foreknew. So, um, so far we know that those that were going to be saved, God knew them and he conformed them. He predestinated that they will be conformed to the image of his son. Like we don't have that spiritual body yet. So they will be confirmed, conformed. And those that he predestinated, those are the ones that he called because they answered the call of the gospel. So uh, those that are predestinated are those that are the called. Look at Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse thirteen. Second Thessalonians two thirteen. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification and the spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? So God had chosen us to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. So he has chosen us to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth. Right? It is by, the, by God that you are born again and because you believe the truth. Whereunto he called you. So we are going backwards now. You are chosen. How did you get? Uh, you are chosen to salvation through you know the spirit where unto he called and believe the spirit is drawing you and you believe the truth which is the gospel where unto you were called by the gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ so it kind of explains it backwards how you were chosen but people you know twist that so the call is to salvation in first Peter chapter 5 verse 10 you have to open there in fact open the first Thessalonians 5 first Peter 5 10 the Bible says but the God of all grace who had called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that he have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So the Bible says he has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, the God of all grace, right? And there's a call to that grace. And how do you accept it? By accepting the call is by believing. All right, let's move on. Whom he called 
then he also justified. So they are not justified randomly, right? Or, or because of their good works. That's not why they are justified. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 23. 1 Thessalonians 5 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and your soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is talking about your justification. You'll be preserved blameless. That means you are just. Look at verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. So them that are called, them he justified. Them he made perfect then their sins are not counted you see them that are called because they answer the call then he's going to justify them none of their works is not random you see he foreknew them he predestinated them to be conformed to, to be conformed to the image of his son um, then that he predestinated he called then that he called he justified so that's what the Bible is saying. Uh, believers cannot lose their salvation because the Bible says, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Do what? Pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You be presented to God. Jesus will present us without spot, without uh, blemish, uh, no wrinkles, nothing. He will present us perfect to God. That's, uh, the church. That's in Ephesians chapter 5. All right, so believers cannot lose their salvation. Even Lot, that was calling the Sodomites, brethren, was a just man. That just man uh, vexed his soul, as the Bible says, every day looking <laughs> or being in Sodom, basically. Uh, Solomon was a just man, but look at how he ended his life. He said, oh, but if you don't hold on to the end or endure to the end, then you will not be saved. No, Solomon was at war with God, basically, the end of his life. You know, we tend to forget that part of the Bible, <laughs> but he was fighting against God to, you know, try, trying to kill the person that God wanted to appoint king, Jeroboam, right? So Solomon uh, was against God at that time, and that's how he ended his life. But he was a just man. It's written in Hebrews. He was saved. All right, whom he justified, them he also glorified. So let, let's, I think that's the last one there. So let's go through everything again. Whom, for whom, verse 29, Romans 8, 29, for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Open to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 40. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 40. So all believers will be glorified. That's what God is saying. Because uh, he foreknew, God foreknows or foreknew from the beginning of the world that they would believe. And he has predestinated them uh, to be conformed to the image of his son. And them he has called, them he has justified, and them he will glorify. So, uh, all believers will be glorified. We shall be in the image of Christ. Remember the transfiguration when Jesus took James, Peter, James, and John uh, to the Mount of Olives, I think, and transfigured himself in front of them. And you see Moses and Eli uh, Elijah next to Jesus, and they're all glowing, right? That is what it means to be glorified. God showed uh, the disciples his glorified image. And we shall be like that. We shall be, conf we'll be conformed to the image image of the sun. So glorified, it means to shine. And uh, although we're all defined glories, as the Bible says, open to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'll take you back real quick as you open 1 Corinthians 15. In 2 Thessalonians 2, what we read already, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, we've been called so that we can obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. All believers should be glorified. Or we'll define glories, as the Bible says. See there in 1 Corinthians 15, 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. So celestial means heavenly, terrestrial means earthly. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So there's the light of the sun, and it's different from the light of the moon, and it's different from the light of the stars. That's what the Bible says. They all define glories, right? The two great lights and, you know, the other lights. But they still define glory. 
verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. You see, we're not all just going to be sons. And all of us just, you know, the, the bright Lord star or something. We're all going to differ in glories. That's what the Bible says. When we are conformed to the image of the Son, yes, we're going to be glorified like the Son. But we're going to differ in glories. So, so also is the resurrection. I read verse 42 again. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So let's understand that. When he says we conform to the image of his son, that's what he's talking about. But we all define glories. You know, depending on your rewards and you know what God decides, who sit next to him and all of that. <laughs> Alright. Now, predestination according to Calvinism. Predestination according to Calvinism. Because I, I want to first make you understand predestination. See what the Bible says about predestination. And not so that you don't miss the first phrase there. Whom he did for no. The predestination according to Calvinism is that God predetermines who will be saved. They forget about the part that is those that God foreknew that will believe. Right? But oh, God just predetermines who will be saved. And let me bring out my let me launch for the first time my professor glasses that I'm going to call <laughs> Bishop Secular. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> um, this is the Calvinist predestination. Uh, this is the first time launching this, Bishop Secular. So when I'm, because. When I'm um, not being serious or when I'm talking like a false prophet, I want you to know that I'm talking like a false prophet, right? So you don't get confused. Like, is Pastor serious here? Is that what he means? So this is why I'm launching this. And before that, so the Calvinisms, or I say Calvinism, the Calvinists, uh, they say, uh, God predetermines who will be saved. Those, uh, those that are not to be saved, they are the ones that are not chosen. They are the uh, pre preterations. So preterition is, oh, God has overlooked these people. So God predetermines these people and overlooks these people. You see how they go hand in hand. And they preach preterition as doctrine. The doctrine of preterition. That too bad for you, God overlooked you. But it's not really too bad for you. But in fact, sorry. Oh yes. So we are the saved ones. You know, we're, we're all saved. And you, you, people out there, they are not saved. You know, God has overlooked them. I mean, just look at them, how they are living their lives. It shows that God has overlooked them. I mean, too bad. But don't look at it as God is wicked. We all are doomed to go to hell. But God just handpicked you and I. From the beginning of the world, God handpicked you and I. The Bible says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. I have foreordained you. What does the Bible say? It is not by power. It's not by might, but it's by the Holy Ghost. It's by the Spirit of God that God chose us from the beginning of the world. The race is not to the swift. Mm. Neither is the battle to the strong. But time and chance. You were born at a certain time that God wouldn't use you for this time and this age and God chose us. <laughs> Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. <laughs> Bible says all have sinned. We've all sinned. We're all condemned. But the grace of God has appeared to us. God has chosen us. That is grace. That is grace. Just wave your hands and say grace. Just say grace. Open to Romans 11.33. Romans 11.33. I'll show you what the Bible says. All the depths of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who had, who, for who had known the mind of the Lord? Who has known his mind? Or who had been his counselor? Or who had first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom the glory forever. Amen. They haven't, they haven't said anything, by the way. <laughs> Who can search his riches and his wisdom? He chooses you, he chooses I, and he overlooks them. You see, he overlooks them. So let's just be in the Lord. Let's just be happy that we're in the Lord. Because my ways are not your ways. Neither are my thoughts your thoughts. See, God says, my will and my counsel shall stand. Woo! I haven't said anything. 
I was just quoting Bible <laughs> without context, just saying how great God is, and just pushing the fact that God chose you and He overlooked them. No, no content. But with all these passages I've thrown out, out of context, twisting it and resting it, you believe that you're chosen and these guys are not chosen. Everyone else, they are not chosen. And that is how they preach. That is uh, um, Calvinism to you, for you. So if you challenge them with the doctrine, uh, if you challenge the doctrine with the factor of, oh, how about free will, right? Free will, how about our choice? Then they throw this at you. <laughs> still gives you free will us that he picked luckily for you you believed because he picked you to be saved he waited for you to believe and you believed so you chose when you'll be saved because you believed so you have to believe Amen. <laughs> so that's what they say so they, they still put in free will but after God has chosen you then you are free to choose it's, it blows my mind. So the rest of the two the scriptures while completely ignoring other clear scriptures. And let me just give you a rundown, just very brief, of other clear scriptures that says that God, salvation has appeared unto all men, as the Bible says, actually. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have just those that are chosen? No. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. God wants all men to be saved. He's saying, pray for all men. Pray for kings so that you live peaceable and quiet life. You know, uh, this is good and acceptable in the eyes of God. If, if you're living in peace and you're allowed to go do so winning, he's telling you pray for the king so that you can go and do so winning so all men will be saved. Do you see that? Who will have all men to be saved? Will mean there means want. God wants all men to be saved. And he gave himself a ransom for all. Right? So our prayer for all men, if according to the Calvinists, our prayer for all men is in vain because some men are not going to be saved. So why are we praying for all men? Just pray for the ones that are chosen. No, God says pray for all men, and all means all, right? Look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. As you open to 1 Timothy chapter 4, I'll, I'll read you another two popular Bible verse, uh, past, uh, verses. 1 Timothy chapter 4. But in Isaiah 45, 22, the Bible says, Look unto me, Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be ye saved. Israel, for I am... No, it's not Israel. Oh, sorry, you're not reading. I'm reading. All right. Look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. He didn't just say Israel or my chosen people. And this is all the way back in the Old Testament, right? God sent Jeremiah to preach to the whole, all the nations of the world. Right? Not just um, uh, Israel, uh, Judah at the time. No. God sent Moses. He, the, the, the knowledge of God spread around uh, the whole world. They all knew about the, the Red Sea. The crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, in the days of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the same thing. The knowledge of God spread around. God wants all men to say, says, look unto me and be ye saved. You see that? All the ends of the earth. In Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto, or has appeared to all men. It's to all men, not just to the pointed selected few. So they just skip all these verses. They don't quote all these verses. They just ignore them. You know, the preterition uh, doctrine completely ignores that. You're in 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 10. 1 Timothy 4.10 For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. 
Now that's what they hold on to. Right? It's the study of all men. Oh, but not just all. It's not all men. He says, especially of those that believe. And those that believe are those that God has already chosen to believe. That's what they say. But what does specially mean there? Let's see how that place was used in the Bible. Look at Acts chapter 25. Acts chapter 25. Acts chapter 25. So this, this specialist area, they twist. And they say, oh yeah, Savior of all men, but only those that believe. You know, that, that, that's not what specially means. All right, Acts chapter 25, look at verse 23. I'm going to read this passage. Uh, this is when Paul was being presented to Agrippa. Um, so, it starts from verse 23. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice, with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing, with the chief captains and, the, and principal men of the city. So, who was come? Agrippa, Bernice, chief captains, principal men of the city. So, there are a whole bunch of people that are there, right? They've entered into the place of hearing. Let me start again. Verse 23. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come and Bernice with, the, with great pomp and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and the principal men of the city, at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men, you see that, which are here present. So it's not just King Agrippa, it's all the men that are present that I just listed in preceding verse. All right, and first I said, King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us, you see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore I have brought him before you, and Especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination, that after examination, King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. So, what is he saying about specially? Paul was brought forth spe uh, before all those men, right? But specially before King Agrippa, because he wants King Agrippa to give his judgment, right? But it doesn't mean that Paul wasn't brought forth before all those men. It, it doesn't mean that, oh, he was brought forth before these men, but oh, no, not before these ones. They couldn't see Paul. It was only King Agrippa. No, it's, it's just that uh, 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 Agrippa's judgment was what was really sought, right? He wanted Agrippa to say something, like his judgment as well was sought. But all those other men, you know, the entourage, they came and Paul is brought forth before all of them especially uh, especially before thee O King Agrippa and that's why you have these and, and thou's very important in, in King James KJV, very important because if not it would just be you, especially before you, you see that and you could mean multitudes or one person, right? So you doesn't really specify the when it's talking about singular so especially before thee, O King Agrippa, for it seemed to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. So when God is saying uh, in 1 Timothy 4.10, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. So he's the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. What does that mean? It means similarly, uh, God saved everybody. He's the Savior of all men, but those that believe are the ones that are keen to it, the ones that will benefit from it. You see that? But if you don't believe, then you're not going to benefit from it. But it doesn't mean that God did not save you or God did not die for you. He, he, you were bought with a price, right? So you had the chance to be saved, you did not believe, and therefore you didn't get saved. Jesus even died for reprobates. Now, reprobates cannot be saved because they cannot believe. It's not because God cannot forgive their sins. God can forgive those the sins, but they cannot believe. God has given up on them. He's no more. The call is not for them anymore. You see that because they passed the stage. But that's reprobate doctrine. So God wants everyone saved. They, they, they miss scriptures like Second Peter chapter three verse ten. As I read that, open to Revelation twenty two, which will be the last one. Revelation twenty two seventeen. Second Peter three ten. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some sorry. Second Peter three nine. <laughs> the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Not 
not willing. Will there means not wanting. God does not want anyone to perish. Oh, but then he chooses some and lets some perish. You see that? No. God does not want anyone to perish. The call is out to everyone. So grace has appeared to all men. He's calling everyone to be saved. He doesn't even want. It's not that I'm calling you to be saved, but I don't want you to be saved. Right? No. <laughs> Unless you're a reprobate, like the Pharisees. You don't want them to understand the gospel, else they'll be healed. Right? So, uh, he's calling everyone to be saved. He doesn't want anyone to perish. Now, finally, the end of the Bible, right? The last revelation given at the end, Revelation 22, last chapter, pretty much the last sentences of the Bible, verse 17. Look at what the Bible says. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that hear it say, Come. And let him that is at thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The call is out there. Come. Come. Let him that hear it, you're hearing the word of God. God is saying, go out and say, come. Go out and call. Go out and preach the gospel. Say, come. And let him that is at thirst come. Like the woman at the well. She said, oh, give me the water that will thirst no more. So if you're still going to be, if you're still thirsting, then come and drink. Let him, uh, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life free. That's talking about salvation. That's talking about being saved. So it says, whosoever will. It is not God that predetermines and says, okay, these are the ones that will be saved. But God is saying, anybody that wants, you want to answer the call? The call is to everyone. The grace is sent out to everyone. All right, Calvinistic predestination is damnable heresy. So is the doctrine of preterition, right? Preterition, God chooses to save some and not the others. You know, exclude some from salvation. That means saying these ones cannot be saved, right? No matter what they do, what they believe, how hard they try, nothing. I'm not trying to reach them, not because of babies. They talk about babies. A baby is born out there. This one is going to hell. <laughs> like if this one dies right now, it's going to hell. That is what preterition doctrine teaches. So, and that is wrong. You know, Paul says, I was once alive, then the Lord came in and I died. So babies are going to heaven, right? But preterition doctrine says, oh, God picks them who is going to heaven and who is not going to heaven, which is damnable heresy, which is wrong doctrine. And it's just like casting lots because they are all, according to the doctrine, everyone is equally damned, right? Let's look at the five points of Calvinism real quick. Five points of Calvinism. So you understand what I mean. It's called tulip, right? Number one, total depravity. That man is dead and cannot do good works. Man also cannot believe. Why can't man believe? Because it is good works. If you want to believe the gospel, that means you're doing good works. Seriously? <laughs> like believing is now works. Believing good things is be believing good. Like believing the gospel is believing good is good works. That's what they teach. That's why man is totally depraved. And total depravity is false doctrine because man can believe, <laughs> right? And that is not works. It's not good works. And Jesus made that very clear, in John. And I don't want to dive so much into it. Very clear, John. He says, "Hey, why don't you labor for you know the, the meat that doesn't perish? Why don't you labor and?" Have uh, for that and they asked him what labor what work should we do and he said believe that's not a work that's nothing for them to do so uh, verse 2 uh, sorry, I said verse 2 the second one total depravity so T is for total depravity U is for unconditional election and that is uh, where predestination comes in you know wrong understanding of biblical predestination that's what the sermon is focused on so I'm going to go through that again number 3 which is limited atonement so Tulip, T-U-L, L is limited atonement. That means the death of Christ is limited only for those that God picked to go to heaven. You see that? I already explained that God, Jesus died for everyone, especially them that believe, right? So they pick that specially and say, oh no, you see, the death is only for those that believe, right? Only those that are chosen. And that is wrong. The death of Christ for everybody. He died for the whole world. He died for all men. Grace appeared to all men. Everyone is called. Number four is irresistible grace. And this one is a joke. <laughs> I, I mean, all of them are pretty much bad, but this one is actually laughable. Irresistible grace means that if God chooses you, you will be saved. You cannot resist it. Like, eventually, I don't care how it happens, maybe it's on your last breath, I accept. 
Like, <laughs> you will be saved. That's what this <laughs> democrats means. And you know, they go about proving it. Just like, uh, you know, Bishop Secular. They go about proving it. And this is, uh, uh, l- let me show you. Open to, uh, in fact, let me read this. Psalm 110, Psalm 110 verse 3, they say, this is what they quote, that irresistible grace is real. And they say this, the Bible says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. You see, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. So God has picked who will be saved. And when God is ready to save you, you will be willing to be saved. Therefore, you will call upon the Lord for salvation. Because it's irresistible grace. And this is how they prove that it is not like God will be dragging you to, to, to be saved. No, it's that you will just be willing when God is ready to save you. You see, so when you, if you talk to somebody, you're wasting your time. I mean, when God's ready to save that person, that person is going to seek the Lord, that person is going to find God, and that person is going to be saved. Because they'll be willing. You see that? You know, that's when they'll come to church. That's when they'll get their life right. That's when, you know, because in the day of God's power, they'll be willing. Open to Psalm 110. Let's read the Bible. I mean, I, I read it, but let's really understand it in context. Because they are doing Bishop Secular for us there. Psalm 110, look at how it starts. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. What does that have to do with salvation? That when they are ready to be saved, they'll get get saved. He's talking about the millennial reign. (laughs) I mean, it's completely something different. But, oh, thy people shall be willing. That is the people that God has already chosen. Oh, they'll be willing to be saved in the day of thy power. Just stick the Bible and just take it out of context completely. Just... Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. This is what they quote. This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So, see, when God picks you and puts his grace upon you, you be what you are. Like, what you are is what you are. There's nothing you can do about it. Paul, there was nothing Paul could... Sorry, Bishop Secular. So when God puts his grace upon you, there's nothing that you can do about it. What you are is what you are. I am what I am. God's grace is upon me, and that's why I was called to be a pastor. There was nothing I could do. That's nothing. Even if I said, even if I run like Jonah and run away, God will make me a pastor. So there's nothing that is irresistible grace, folks. Irresistible grace. See, he says, but, uh, uh, but I labored more abundantly than they all. But it's not me that was laboring. It was just God. He was just using me and using me. The grace of God was with me. That's what made me what I am. I am what I am. Completely forgetting about your will, the work you have to put in. You just ignore all of that. Oh, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And they take that out of context. So Paul had to believe. Paul chose to believe. But that's taken out of context. Anyway, irresistible grace is just ridiculous. Verse, and the fifth one and the last one, preservation of the saints. Tulip. So P, preservation of the saints. Now, this is teaching once saved, always saved. Amen? Once saved, always saved. But they mix truth in lies. And before you get to the only truth, look at all the lies you have to believe. <laughs> you have to believe, oh, you're, you're totally depraved. You cannot uh, believe uh, good works. Sorry, believing is good works. So therefore, God has to choose you for you to believe. Right? So you believe unconditional election. You believe limited atonement that God died for a specific few. And you believe irresistible grace. And therefore, once saved, always saved. And that's why some people hear once saved, always saved. And they associate, you know, with Calvinism. And, and that's why they hate the term once saved, always saved. Because that's the plan of the devil. Doctrines of devils. Alright, let's conclude here.
Over to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. So there are two passages in the Bible that talk about predestination. Predestination, uh, the title of the sermon is Predestination and Preterition. Two passages talk about predestination. One is in Romans, and that's what we read. Really explains it and breaks it down, how those that are pre uh, predestinated are those that God foreknew. Right? So he foreknew that they would be believers, so that's why he predestinated them. The second passage there is in Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 1 mentions predestination, or those predestinated. But I'll read from verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So we are chosen to be justified. That's what he's saying. Now he's, he's going backwards and backwards. He first starts off with, this is how we're going to end up. We've been chosen to be justified. Remember in Romans, he explains how he got to be chosen to be justified. Now we're going the other way backwards. Let's Let's keep going. Verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So what does he say? We are predestinated to be conformed to the image of God. Remember, we're still going backward. So he had, we've been chosen to be justified, but he, uh, having predestinated us so backwards, that's a step before that, having predestinated us, us to be conformed to the image of God, that means adoption. That means we'll be like Christ. We'll be children like Jesus, uh, like so sons of God, like Jesus, to the praise of, verse 6, to the praise of his, of, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, that means we're in the family now, in whom we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he had abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he had proposed in himself. So it's God that decided that those that will believe, he could have just said those that will believe, he would just make them Adam again. You know? But no, he said he will make them like his son. <laughs> right? He will give them that glory, they will shine, they will rule, all of that. But it's just the good pleasure of his will. That's what he wanted to do. Those that will believe the gospel, I'm going to justify them, I'm going to glorify them, I'm going to make them conform to the image of my son. It's God's will. That's what he chose to do. It's not that it's God's will that he chose them without them choosing them, like believing the gospel. It's God that chose them. No, it's, it's what he chose to do to them that believe. Do you see that? All right, let's keep going. Verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. So predestinated after the counsel of his will. So this is what I want them to do since I foreknow that they will believe I predestinated them to be this. Not that I predestinated them to be saved without without um, their choice. I keep going back and back like a broken record, but I want to be clear. Verse 12, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. See, now we're going all the way back to now. You can see it is their decision. It's a decision of the people that they trusted. They first trusted in Christ. And it goes on to say, in whom ye also trusted after. So when did you trust? After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You see, it's when you heard the gospel, we've been going all the way back from your justification, all the way back to how you got saved. In this passage here. Uh, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. You see, it just went all the way backwards. But people didn't get that all the way backwards, and it's like, oh no, God predestinated them, and therefore they believed. No. <laughs> you can see how it was in, in Romans, how it says it, and it was just going backwards. After having, you know, telling you this happened before this, this happened before that, and this happened before this. You see that? So, that's how you understand Ephesians chapter 1, uh, predestination in Ephesians chapter 1. 
All right, what is the uh, importance of understanding predestination? Three reasons I'm going to point out as we close. Open to Romans chapter 4. That's the last passage we read. Romans chapter 4, verse 16. So number one is knowing, know the attributes of God. Know who God is. Because they don't understand who God is. They don't understand the attributes of God. If you think that God is willing to you know, sacrifice some people. Oh yeah, everybody, well, everyone's all damned. Everyone's totally depraved. Uh, I'll just speak random people. No, that's not who God is. That's not the God we serve. Uh, we serve. Maybe that's another Jesus that died for particular sins. But our God died for everyone. Jesus died for all men and he wants all men to be saved. And also, know that God knows the end from the beginning. They forget about the foreknowledge of God. God knows the end from the beginning. That's an attribute. And God is not affected by time. In fact, God will say things that are not as though they are. The Bible says in Romans 4.16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. You see that? You can even point out to salvation. It is of faith that it might be by grace. Oh no, we're just saved by the grace of God. No, it's of faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith. You got to believe first. The grace is there, but you have to believe. It's not, oh, the grace is just impacted irresistibly on you. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not, uh, not to that only which is of the law, but also, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is father of us all. So now it's going to point out, you know, God called Abraham the father of us all, right? The father of many nations. Why did he say that? Because God knew at the end from the beginning. And he's going to explain who God is here. Look, verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him who before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead, that's who God is, and called those things which be not as though they were. That is who God is. So he calls things that are not as though they are. And they don't understand that God has foreknowledge and he can just say, Oh, you are justified. Oh, I've chosen you for this. But he has foreknowledge because he knows that you believe. So yes, he has chosen. He knew that this person would be saved. He knew what Jeremiah would do. He knew so it is God's foreknowledge. It's not that he forced Jeremiah to be that. Oh, I've made Jeremiah so that he can be a prophet and he can be this. And I made the other prophet in Jeremiah's times to run away so that he can kill him in Egypt. You see that? No, that's not how God did it. It's that man that chose what he would do and God foreknew what to happen. And therefore, God was working with Jeremiah. <laughs> he said, Jeremiah, you know, I know what I put in you and he knew that Jeremiah would choose to do that. All right, number two, I want you to understand or the importance of uh, understanding predestination is beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, right? False doctrine. The false doctrine of Calvinism, predestination, and preterition. Uh, see, you can easily judge many people to be reprobate. You go talk to them and they are reprobate or maybe you're not yet ready for the gospel. Ah, he looks like he's a good guy. He looks like he'll be saved, but he's not yet ready or something. And you don't pray for all men. You don't go out and preach the gospel because, you know, eventually everyone will be saved. Like everyone that God has chosen will be saved. God knows everyone will be saved, so everyone God has chosen will be saved. Um, and it renders the first part of the Great Commission vain. Why go out and preach the gospel to all nations when you know that those that will be saved will be saved? You see that? So be careful of the leaven of Pharisees. It's just spread and it's leaven the whole lump. So, um, and it renders this hymn useless. Like, why you did the hymn, Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while or not as thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, 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 hear my humble cry, while or not as thou art calling, do not pass me by. So, if God was going to pass you by, I mean, why are you crying out? I mean, <laughs> if you are chosen, you are chosen. If you are not chosen, you get my point. So why are you singing that him? Right? <laughs> because he has chosen, he has chosen. And he hasn't chosen. Look at the guy shouting, blind Bartimaeus. Uh, Jesus, son of David. Jesus, son of... See, if he didn't shout by, God would have passed him by. Right? I mean, Jesus passing by, walking on the water, and was going to pass them by. And they're like, afraid. And they're like, what is the spirit? And then Jesus came. The Bible says he was going to pass them by. So you call out, 
And you get saved. He was there to say, he saw them suffering and he went there. You know? So the grace was available and they called upon him. All right. Number three and the last one, so winning, which I already pointed out. So on the gospel, uh, the uh, doctrine of predestination and preterition is against soul winning. That is the whole point too, or one of the major points. If it can infiltrate into living churches, and make them dormant and soul winning. Because if they believe that everyone will be saved, what is the, what is the reason to go soul winning? If you believe everyone will be saved. So go soul winning, God wants all men saved. Not just, you know, America. He wants those in Iran too. Yeah, bl blow them up. No, God wants all of them saved. Oh man! Whether color, white, black, social status, he wants all men saved. Don't quickly judge people to be reprobates. Understand that Jesus had paid the price already. He paid the price for their sins. He has suffered on the cross, not just for you and I. It's for everyone. So don't let his death be in vain for those that you can reach. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us about predestination and preterition. Help us to understand uh, the false doctrine of predestination and preterition and help us to understand Understand the biblical meaning of predestination, what God means by uh, pre predestinating us, to understand the foreknowledge of God and how, how wicked the doctrine of preterition is. I pray, oh Lord, that you help us to uh, not slack in soul winning, help us to use this doctrine and um, uh, for those that you died for, let us reach them and let us get them saved. Let us call, let us shout come as the Bible says, the end of Revelation. It says, those that hear it say come. So let us say come to all of them. Let's send out that call of the gospel to everyone around us, oh Lord, everyone that we can reach. I pray you give us the strength to do so, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank Thank you for the church as we end and close for today. Pray you continue to be with us and bless us and bring us back to the next fellowship that we have, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.